Welcome back. Let's uh, now go through the presentation of the third paper in this session. This is uh, it's titled, it's titled Restoring Confidence Systemic, Systemic, Systemically, Systemically Important Banks. It's some effects uh, on bank performance. The presenter is Burkhard Ronick. This paper is jointly produced uh, with Michael uh, Sigmund from the National Bank of Austria. Uh, thank you for inviting me. As it was said, this is joint work with uh, Michael Sigmund. And I uh, have to mention that he did all the hard work. He did the hard work with the data and did the estimation. So I had the privilege to do much of the conceptual work and writing this thing up. So <laughs> obviously he's the older one, of, uh, the younger one of us. So, uh, so uh, the views are our own views. and. And now I think we can, can jump into the uh, presentation. So the, the structure of the presentation is I give an introduction. This will be very short because uh, when we present this paper at academic conferences, you will be surprised people don't know close to nothing about the SSM. So you have to talk a while and a while about the SSM. They don't know much about it. I can skip this basically. I'll talk only a little bit about the data. I will spend much time on our empirical strategy because uh, this is talk is a little bit different than usual because we use we use uh, methods, conceptual methods which uh, were originally developed in computer science and and are slowly moving into economics, but I um, expect are not very well known. And so I take the chance to introduce them. In every earlier version of the paper, we refrained from from putting it in and talking about, but we, in the end, we decided we have to make it clear how we came to our identification, how, what is behind what we are doing. And so to be completely transparent, we have, we have now introduced, uh, took much more time to introduce the uh, identification of the effects. I'll talk about the results, which are very in favor. SSM people will really like it. So, so, uh, so I, I think, and the results of uh, which I was very, very, uh, I'm very glad to see that the results are perfectly consistent with, with the results of the two earlier papers. So that's also kind of nice to see that they used very different methods, different data sets, but in the end, the results are, uh, are consistent. And then uh, I also want to take some time to talk about, to explain a little bit how we, how we try to explore the sources behind SSM effects, of what nature are these effects. And then I conclude, motion will be very short. So as I said, the introduction uh, can basically uh, be skipped. You know all this. Uh, so uh, I'll leave a switch second slide. The, uh, the thing that I want to mention here is all the, which is on the slide, is well known to all of you, but uh, to our, to our uh, wording, we say to the significant banks, which these are banks above 30 million billion euros, which or which are economically important, or or uh, and, uh, or have significant cross-border uh, activities, uh, we we simply call them SSM banks, which is obviously technical, not correct. All banks are the SSM banks; they are significant, less significant. But for most readers, it's easier. If you say SSM banks are banks supervised by the ECB directly, so that's how we how we use it. It's it's it's, it's a short it's a, sh a shortcut, you know. Uh, so we are well aware that this is not technical and not correct, but it makes the presentation easier. Um, we also know many large banks were heavily affected by the by the crisis, by the two crises. So we ask. Did the SSM, which was a reaction to the crisis, help to improve performance and soundness of the SSM banks? And what are the main sources of this, these effects? We take three, we look at three uh, outcome variables with, with simple return on asset, on risk weights, like an average risk weight, 
and the return on risk weighted assets, which in some sense is a combined measure of performance with which uh, combines income with risk taking to some extent, in some sense. And as I said, we, we want to, we want to uh, explore the resources of SSM and banks, or likely, likely in sources. Uh, what we are we doing? So we estimate the SSM effects. What, what uh, is different to other papers, we estimate direct, indirect, and total SSM effects. I want to explain this to you in a minute. And we do a bunch of robustness checks to see if our results survive these tests and explore the sources in a, in a separate section. So what we find in a nutshell is the SSM has positive effects on return on assets. Of SSM banks, it is negative or no impact, no impact, negative to no impact on risk rates. Depends a little bit on the model we're using. It has a positive effect on return on risk weighted assets. It may come from more income, less risk taking, or both. And the SSM has mainly direct effects. So this means uh, translated more confidence, better risk management, things like that. Not so much, doesn't result so much only from adjustment, much, much comes from confidence and these more, uh, let's say, uh, qualitative sources of, or reasons of SSM effects. Uh, so in the end, we come up with finding that uh, the components of the return of risk weighted assets, when we, uh, when we look at them, they clearly suggest uh, more confidence and, and better risk management in SSM banks. So these are the results in a nutshell. The data uh, come from the official S SNL financials database. We have uh, unbalanced panel data. We have about 2,600 banks, about 116 S SSM banks. We do some data cleaning uh, with other data resources, Bloomberg, Eurostat, ECB. I'll just show you now a picture, which is now in the appendix of the paper, but it's simply to show you uh, how, how the, uh, the three outcome variables look uh, develop over time for SSM, non-SSM back. These are size-adjusted figures, so the effects of size have been, have been already removed from this data. Uh, this is for people who do diff and diff. They look, they look at these pictures uh, very, very heavily. But here you just see to get an impression how the data look for SSM and non-SSM banks. I will come to all this uh, in a minute. I skip the summary statistics. You see the bank specific variables we're using uh, for certain in certain models. We also have macro variables which are not here in, in, in this statistics, but I will explain why we use and not use these variables in what we are doing in a minute. So now I come to the empirical strategy, which I will spend most of my time because I have the chance to, to show you something many of you might not have seen that often before. So what I put here on this slide is a, is a causal graph. So this causal graph is a stylized graph which so shows the basic identification problem. So the point here is you have the SSM effect, you have the SSM, this is the treatment, and you want to you want to measure the effects on the outcome variable, which is the Y variable. And there are direct effects, this is the red arrow, and there are also indirect effects. We go via variables, M mediating variables, variables. Uh, that react where, where the bank, for example, in our case, these are, these are variables where the bank can react. And the effect of the SSM is transmitted via, via these reactions to the outcome variable. We have uh, criteria for becoming an SSM bank. These determine, these are the, uh, determine why you are an SSM bank or not, why you are significant or not. And we have a bunch of we have economic environmental variables. This could be macro variables, structural variables, everything. And in this Interplay, the goal is to identify direct and indirect SSM effects. The indirect SSM effect, I'll start with the indirect one. This is the effect, as I already explained, which are running via the mediating variables. We think of these variables as variables un under control, important variables under control of the bank. So here I have an example here, SSM regulators force banks to hold more capital, which may affect the outcome variable, easy example. We have a direct effect. This is what I will call like a confidence effect. Uh, for example, markets think or customers think the SSM banks are, are, better, are better supervised than non-SSM banks. 
and this may attract deposits and enable cheaper funding. By the way, when we think about uh, SSM, we think about that the ECB is the tougher and has more resources and is probably the toughest supervisor than national authorities. So this is the, this is the let's say, a kind of background how we think about SSM. Because SSM, as was mentioned before, is, you know, can, can mean many things, but this is how we, how we basically see it. And then we have a total effect. This is the direct effect plus the indirect effect. So this is what we want to identify. So now to do it, you have to introduce some things. How you can, how you can, how you can uh, uh, come up with uh, with an identification strategy. Before I do it, I have to shortly introduce uh, three causal patterns, which you, which you should know. So behind all that, there's a deep theory coming coming from computer science and a beautiful theory, which is uh, beyond all this, which uh, behind all this, but which I cannot cannot explain here for for time reasons. It's, uh, Great books about it, and it's really, really interesting. So, but we only need a few elements of all of this. We need to know causal patterns, and they're talking about three of them. There is the fork. There are three variables, x, y, and z. And in the first case, the fork, as the name says, the variable z causes x and y. So, and this leads to spurious correlation. So the variable y, uh, z leads to spurious correlation between x and y. In the chain, x, uh, causes Z and this causes Y. This is the, like in the indirect effect, this is the chain. And so the variable in the middle mediates the effect from X to Y. And the collider is a completely different animal. The collider is a constellation where X and Y are both causes of Z. And Z is a, so Z is a joint outcome of X and Y. Why I'm telling you this? Because the effect of conditioning in a model is, is different. It's different depending on the constellation you're having. If you have a fork, if you condition on Z, you hold Z constant, that's what you do in a, usually want to do in a regression. You block the, the, the causal path between uh, X and Y and you remove the spurious correlation. That's what you want to get an unbiased estimate of the effect. In the chain, if you condition on Z, uh, you block the path between uh, X and Y, this in that sense to kill, you're killing the effect, you're blocking the effect, you're killing it. If you're doing this, in the collider is completely different. If you condition the collider on a joint outcome, you're creating correlation. So but this is because you, uh, you introduce selection bias. This is important. Uh, if you don't, if you don't uh, condition the collider, things will be as they are. If you condition it, things will become dependent. So and you will introduce bias. So two more things, then I'm basically done with this. Uh, th from this, what I told you before, you can derive blocking rules. You can you can think about how you can block causal causal pathways uh, between variables. If you, as I've already explained, if you have if you have a if the if you have a chain, for example, or a fork, you can break you can block the path by by conditioning. On this variable uh, w, which is which is either in between on the path. If there is a collider, you don't condition on it, so you must not condition on it. Otherwise, you open up the path. So this is important. This is basically everything you need to know about this. And the backdoor the backdoor criterion simply I don't want to go into this in detail. Simply says that uh, that you should remove any spurious correlation. And you should leave all the paths between the uh, treatment and the outcome open. This is what, and if you do this, you get you get an identified effect. This is what, it, in a nutshell, what this says. So this is enough now. Now, so one more slide. So I also don't go into the detail, but I just tell you if you want to uh, identify the total effect. Uh, interestingly, this is the easiest thing to do: the total effect, indirect plus indirect effects. Uh, requires only blocking for the selection criteria, nothing more. This is size of the bank and economic importance. So this economic importance we capture because it's unobserved with a fixed effect type thing. This is all you need. You don't need any other control variables to do that. If you want to estimate a direct effect, it's becoming much more challenging because you have to conditioning on the selection criteria for becoming an, uh, a significant bank. You must condition on the mediating variables, but in the way, if you do it, 
if you do it in, in that minute, uh, you open up another path because this is a collider. So you also have to control, you find something to shut down the path. And so in this case, you have to also look to control for macro and environmental variables. So estimating a direct effect is much harder than estimating a total effect, which is much easier. Indirect effect is difference between total and direct effect in our case because it's linear. Our models are linear. In general, this will not be true. In, the, in our case, we make things, things very simple. This will be the case. So now I'm done with this. And so that is the logic behind, behind the identification we are doing. So to recap, if you want to have a direct SSM effect, it's sufficient to control for size and unobserved effects. If you want to have direct effects, you have to control for a bunch of other things, different things. So now, as was uh, mentioned before and discussed, SSM, we measured SSM by a simple dummy. This is obviously can subsume anything and is obviously a proxy. If we would have a better variable, a better proxy, it would be nice if we do it, but in the end, you will always end up with some kind of proxy if you measure, measure the SSM or aspects of the SSM. And this was also discussed, uh, many other things went on during this. So if the SSM would be in isolation and we could completely, uh, then we would have, identification would completely be done. But here we have other things going on, so we have to think about it a little bit. This has to do because we use a dummy, not the identification strategy per se. So single resolution mechanism, this applies to all area banks, became effective in January 2016. So we find SSM effects before that since the SSM became effective. So this is a sign that this is not a problem. Low interest rate environment was also before the SSM. It affected all banks to some extent. And uh, the SSM effects stay there when we control for direct interest and low interest rate environment. Basel III was already mentioned. It has been gradually introduced. There were OC buffers, things like that. Some uh, Basel packages change risk rates, uh, but the effects survive when we control for, for in some or another way for these things. Uh, so uh, I want to also make a placebo test uh, with a fake treatment period, 2010, 2011, uh, with data until 2011, we find no effects. We also look at strategic self-selections. Some have argued that some have tried to reduce their assets uh, to not become a significant banks. This does also doesn't affect it. So we have three types of models. Uh, we have a fixed effects model, we have uh, uh, another model called the FICE model, which is uh, the first two models, these two models use within variation only. It's important because everybody's talking about the control group. In the first two models, the same units are compared before and after treatment. The other, the other uh, banks contribute to estimating the uh, beta parameters on the X variables, but do not directly contribute to the estimation, directly contribute to the estima estimation of the SSM effect. So there is no separate control group in the first, in the first two models. The, the, the units before, after treatment, so they are their own controls in the first two approaches. The third one is a standard diff-diff model that was what most people do. Here is different. Here you use, uh, here you, use, uh, you, you compare two different groups. So you compare, compare within variation of treated and untreated of a treated and untreated group. So this is conceptually different. In the first two cases, you could run the regressions without, even without any untreated banks. It would work, and it works. You can do it. In the third case, you can't do it because you do it if you need, you need a control group. So to clarify this, the results in a nutshell, are we have we are just the time varying effects. And as I already uh, mentioned, uh, the effects are positive for uh, for uh, return on, on uh, assets. We just show effects for uh, fixed effects in the FICE model. We don't use a uh, different diff model to compute direct effects because logically, if you, if you introduce more control variables, you make the control group uh, more and more, let's say you, you allow for more and more dissimilarities. The more you, uh, variables to put in, to, you, you, to, for more dissimilarity, you allow in your comparisons. So we don't want to do that. So we used, uh, fixed effects in the FICE model. The FICE model has the, has the other advantage that you don't need a, some things, such things as parallel trend assumptions and so on. So this is, you don't need to assume it and it's a more flexible model, has its own uh, things. So for the uh, risk weights, we find 
they go down in, in the, in the uh, fixed effects model, which, by the way, the results are very similar to the diff and diff. So if you look at the fixed effects, diff and diff and fixed effects give similar results. Price model are a bit different here. In the other cases, the results go completely in the same directions. Uh, the return on risk-weighted assets is also qualitatively similar, whether you use a, a fixed effects or a price model. So positive effects on on on, uh, on return on risk-weighted assets. So as I told you, we had a, made a, did a number of robustness checks, looked only at large banks, core peripheral countries. There are some difference differences, but the effects don't disappear. Self-selection, as I told you. Uh, we also made a placebo test, and we also made resampling, uh, similar to, in a way like, like cross-validation. We did a huge uh, resampling exercise to see whether the results are robust against outliers, things like that, so the, the results survive all these, all these tests. So in the, skip this one, this, these are just, uh, in the end, we also wanted to look at sources of, of these SSM effects. We already saw the indirect effects are very small. Most of this is, is direct effects, so there's a huge chance that this will be confidence and better risk management, qualitative things. But we also broke up the return on risk weighted assets into components and, and did run the FICE model for each component. The FICE model because we don't need a parallel trend assumption. So this is less restrictive in that respect. That's why we used it in this exercise. And as you see here, the results in a nutshell, uh, the positive uh, loan growth was positive, which was found in the other paper. Uh, also, loan loss reserves uh, went down. This was also found in the other paper. Operating expenses went up a little bit, so tougher supervision is more costly. So this went up. So the effect on the net interest margin was, was basically uh, close to zero. So these were the effects. So all these all this, uh, risk weights are yeah, equal or a little bit lower. So, so we think this uh, shows that banks take, take uh, interpreted banks take less risk. So, uh, OK. So I uh, skipped the results as well, but these are simply the regression results. So uh, already uh, told you, basically, the, the picture showed you what the effects are. Uh, and again, this, these are just the regressions. Uh, but strong positive effects on, 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 on loan growth. But this is a really large, but this has also to do with, which in, with the way how, how the FICE model computes the counterfactual. Don't want to go into detail, but it has to do with, with what the counterfactual looks like in this model. Uh, so the negative SF, uh, SSM effects on the loan loss reserves with the positive effects on bank lending suggests, as we also saw in the other paper, that banks can uh, lend more without increasing exposure to riskier borrowers. This was also a central result of the other paper. Mm -hmm. So this leads us to uh, assume that these are improvements of risk management. So I'll now come to the conclusion, conclusions, and I don't want to repeat much. So in the end, the uh, SSM uh, have positive effects. These seem to be quite quite robust, at least in our in our setting. And uh, we uh, our exploration of the sources of the SSM effects lead us to uh, conclude. This is mainly uh, more confidence in the SSM banks, so uh, from from market participants, and customers, and better risk management, which which might might explain the results, which are probably consistent with the results. So in the end, uh, uh, we we conclude at least the SSM improved the performance and the soundness of the SSM banks. So it's a I think up to now it's a big success story, and so yeah, this this is how we how we. How we, how we, what our data tell us about, about uh, the SSM effects in our setting. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Burkhard. Uh, the discussion is Alex Popov from the ECB. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, 
pleasure to read this paper, uh, important paper, as you saw already, uh, with very pleasing results for SSM supervisors. Um, these views are mine only. That's always an important uh, disclaimer in this time. Uh, in particular, uh, they are not the views of the ECP, most certainly. All right, so the motivation of this paper is that uh, European banks were dangerously weak in the early 2000s, uh, largely due to uh, the twin financial and sovereign debt crisis, uh, contributed to the sovereign debt crisis, and that created the danger that we would enter some sort of a permanent doom loop between sovereigns and banks. At the time, caricatures like this one were uh, omnipresent. Uh, American tourists looking at the Pisa Tower must be a bank. So we needed to do something as policymakers uh, because bank weaknesses have multiple consequences. One is individual and finan uh, systemic financial instability. The other is reduced ability of banks to support the real economy, which we think of as a primary function of banks. So the banking union was concocted, and it has three legs, the SSM, the single resolution mechanism, and the European deposit insurance. All of this aimed at stabilizing banks. Uh, it's not yet complete, as we know, and the evidence is not fully conclusive on how it has affected the banking sector and the real economy. So this is where the paper steps in, uh, analyzes the effect of the introduction of the SSM on bank risk and finds that it has a positive effect on key bank parameters, such as return on assets, income, lending, risk taking. Uh, result is mostly direct. They have this very interesting scheme of uh, separating direct and indirect results. So their claim is that it's mostly via higher profitability and lower risk rather than by a portfolio reallocation. Uh, it's stronger in peripheral than in core countries, something that Burkhardt didn't have time to mention, uh, does not predate the SSM. And the conclusion of the paper is that the SSM has contributed to the recovery and stability of SSM banks by enhancing confidence in their soundness. So something that we sort of hoped for when the SSM took over. So very pleasing. Uh, my assessment of the paper is that it's a very interesting paper on a very important question. We need more work like this. The analysis, as far as I can say, is very rather solid. The results are believable. Of course, I need to discuss it, so I'll have some quibbles. And uh, now every discussion ideally should be uh, useful to the authors and uh, interesting to the audience. Uh, I've noticed that it's very difficult to achieve both things simultaneously. So I'll try to achieve them sequentially. So I'll have first part of my uh, discussion where I'll be, I'll play the stern referee, uh, trying to give you some advice as I see it on how to make the paper more, the analysis more robust. So everyone over the age of 45 should recognize Jack Nicholson in The Shining. That's how I imagine my referees look like when they're rejecting my paper. Uh, and then in the second part of my discussion, I will play the absent-minded philosopher, uh, Everyone under the age of 45 should recognize Slavoj Žižek, uh, one of the stars of modern philosophy. So here I'll give you a bit of a sort of bird's eye view and um, big picture um, ideas about maybe your next paper. Okay, so uh, first theory, uh, your paper lacks motivation. Uh, what, what do we expect to find? Uh, and, and as we know, the theory is ambiguous. Um, on the one hand, supervision by local entities may be more rigorous. Uh, this argument has been made by the literature. Local supervisors can monitor better the banks or they may extract superior information that relates to uh, Miguel's discussion this morning. Uh, on the other hand, of course, centralized supervision may be more effective because it reduces the risk of banks engaging in some sort of cross-border arbitrage, uh, higher supervisory independence, breaking the doom loop, and so on and so forth. So theory is ambiguous, and I would have liked to see some sort of a framing of where your results fall within these competing theories. Um, sort of lead me from the beginning, what am I to expect and why? Why should I expect it? Uh, second uh, broad comment is on your sample. Um, so you have these exercises where you don't have a control group and I, I have to say I, I really don't understand this uh, well because we always need a control group. The idea is that the control group is the, the counterfactual, right? How the treatment group would have behaved in the absence of the SSM. So in the exercises where you do have a control group, uh, what I worry about is that the SSM banks are many fewer and they're much larger. So what we need to do is we cannot compare all banks to all banks. We need to make the sample a little bit more symmetric, look at the 
smaller maybe SSM banks and the larger, uh, less significant institutions, so closer to the threshold. Uh, you have something like that in table six, column one, but I think it should be your baseline sample. Um, comment, second comment is that SSM and non-SSM, as you call them, so SIs and LSIs, uh, differ across multiple dimensions, not just size, uh, and I would like to see that. So I think in your summary statistics, you should compare them. Uh, uh, give me, show me averages of, of the various variables, bank-specific variables that you reported and how these differ across the two distributions. And I think you should also, again, in the test where you do have a control group, uh, do some, some little bit of matching uh, so that you choose pairwise similar banks based on their observed characteristics. Again, the whole idea is to make the control sample and the treatment sample more similar with each other because we know the, the two types of banks are not. Um, my third comment is about the empirical model. So there is a time varying variation that is common to all kinds of banks within a country. And I think you should include country time fixed effects in all of your regressions because then we run the risk of, somebody mentioned it this morning, comparing large French banks to small Slovenian banks. So what you really want to do is compare within the same country the SIs and the LSIs, again, looking at those that are closer to the threshold because otherwise the effect becomes contaminated by all kinds of stuff, which I guess in your computer science uh, inspired approach you try to control, but I'm more old school. I would think that, you know, without doing this, demand, growth opportunities, all kinds of omitted variable bias comes into play, so it needs to be taken care of. Um, some effects are observed already in 20, 2013, as you show in your charts. So that's obviously the effect of the comprehensive assessment slash asset quality review in 13 and 14. So I think you should maybe discuss that and make it an explicit part of the analysis and maybe look at a shorter sample rather than starting in 2005 when the world was a very different place. Um, finally, the effect might be driven by a global trend whereby larger banks became increasingly sound once the sovereign debt crisis were resolved was resolved for reasons unrelated to the SSM, globally speaking. Um, stock markets were booming, you know, uh, whatever the reason. So I would suggest a placebo test where you are uh, identifying uh, sort of banks that would have been supervised by the SSM and banks that would not have been supervised in the SSM in countries that are not part of the SSM and run the exact same test for those. Uh, and if you don't find anything, then it's really an SSM effect. If you again find the difference between larger and smaller banks, then it's some sort of a um, global, global effect that you're attributing to the SSM, but it actually has nothing to do with it. Okay, now my uh, big picture comment. Um, it's about growth and stability. And uh, the, the, the big philosophical question about growth and stability is, are they complements or substitutes? And the economic literature has looked at this for a long time and hasn't reached a unanimous conclusion. So there is one strand of literature which believes that stability generates growth. So in that sense, growth and stability are complements. Uh, there is a famous AR, Ramey and Ramey paper from 95, where they show that countries with lower volatility grow on average faster. And they explain it with this idea that stability breeds growth, whereby um, by sort of making the return on investment more predictable, investors invest uh, at a higher level and that generates growth. So then stability is a great thing for growth. Uh, there is the opposing, however, argument. Uh, Rancière and co-authors in the QGE argue that maintaining high growth basically necessitates the occasional crisis because both crisis and growth are driven by the same forces, which are, let's call them risk-taking. Uh, the, the, the willingness of people to take on risk, to fail, you know, some projects survive, others uh, go into the, the, the drain. And, uh, and once in a while, you have the occasional crisis because too many people are trying to do maybe crazy things, but uh, uh, this attempt to, to lead to the, to the long-term long higher higher growth. So in that world, if you clamp on the forces that are responsible for the occasional crisis, you also uh, reduce long-term growth. So in that world, they are substitutes. So I've always wondered if we can use the SSM implementation to learn something about whether the growth and stability are complements or substitutes. And I'm using the same caricature as um, uh, the previous speaker, yes, this morning, 
which means that either great minds think alike or that fools rarely differ. Uh, but I was more interested in the, thank you, it, it was a caricature from the Financial Times where Martin Wolf, I think, uh, the title was, are European banks too feeble to spur growth? And he was thinking exactly about this. Do we need to bank to make banks safe? And that would lead to more growth. Um, but we don't know the answer to that. And, and um, the truth of the matter is that the last decade uh, has, has seen the most clerotic growth in the history of Europe since the Second World War, both in terms of GDP and in terms of um, productivity. And I'm not saying it's the SSM's fault. It kind of coincides with the introduction of the SSM. It's not the SSM's fault, but maybe we have moved too much in the direction of putting stability on a pedestal. And we have, you know, uh, built this cathedral of stability on the back of the European economy, and maybe it's dragging it down. Uh, so what I would like to know, you show that the, the SSM has made banks safer, but I would like to know how this, this has been translated into the real economy. Have we... Uh, you know, have these safe, have banks become, so what has this safety come, how has it come to be? Uh, is it because we have eliminated uh, dangerous management practices of banks, or is it because we force banks to, to always lend safe? And that would be inconsistent with, with the idea of long-term uh, productivity growth. So that's a big picture comment, it's not for your paper, uh, but, but I would like to think of stability not just, and safety, not in an isolated sort of way, but as a part of a bigger bigger picture, which includes long-term growth. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, important, timely paper. I liked it. I learned a lot. Uh, SSM banks are safer and more profitable. Good to know. We need more work like this, but again, put in a larger context, I would think. Good luck publishing your paper and getting your message through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. I can tell you it has been both very constructive and also very entertaining for the audience to achieve your goal. Okay, uh, Rafael, can you go over there? Rafael first. Yeah. Hi. In, in thinking about uh, the impact on profitability, I can. Th I mean, you have taken the approach of looking at accounting measures return on assets. But of course, there are market measures, and it is well known that European banks are not performing very well in terms of the book-to-market uh, value. And, and so I think it would be interesting, uh, not perhaps for this paper, but to look at the SSM effects from the perspective of market measures of profitability. Let me just say follow follow-on question to this one, because another alternative would have been actually to look at return on equity. To the extent that uh, actually capital has gone up, actually uh, but they, they have gone up in different ways for different type, types of banks, that implication should have a sort of opposite effects on both return on assets and return on equity. I don't know whether you have tried actually to look at that uh, and what the results uh, will change. I don't know. But just hold on and you, okay. you will reply later. Over there, please. Eh? Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. One is um, related to the effect of risk weighted assets. Larger banks tend to use internal ratings more intensively, so you should maybe try and disentangle whether is a, uh, the effect is driven by the intensity of usage of vis-a-vis -vis standard approach as uh, smaller banks tend to use the, the, the latter more than the former, and this is first question. The second question is, uh, as far as I remember, uh, you put on the slide, as for the, the, the say, the, re the source of revenues that affected the, uh, the returns by, by more of the, it, this was, were fees. So uh, probably if you, because you introduced a matching procedure at some point, controlling more directly for business model will help understand whether again is a large, is a size effect or a business model effect. So I think, think this is important to take into account. Thank you, more questions? Can I do a question as well on the on the indirect effects? I think it's very interesting because you say that direct effects are more important than direct effects. You define the direct effects as sort of a, an impact of confidence, which does not translate into standard ratios with balance sheet variables. Uh, so you attribute to, to that, those direct effects an important uh, component of your results. But then at the same time, you explain your result by saying that an important driver of the higher profitability for SSM banks is actually that they, they actually lend more. So how do you link confidence with more lending? I guess not totally obvious to, 
Uh, okay, what do you do? Go on. Mm? The good other questions afterward, I think we have still a few minutes. Mm? So, okay. So, uh, from just uh, one, one word to the control group issue, this is the classical issue because this is uh, to you because uh, I don't want, can't go into the details, but if you, in the different diff setting, you have a control group, a separate in, in, in a panel model, you, you, your own unit is a control group. If you look at it, uh, you, you will you see it. So, the, and by the way, we, we got the same results with and without, uh, with different approaches. So the control group, the different diff seems to be okay. Still okay, it can be made better, better, but the results in the paper, they don't differ really much. So. So in that sense, we are we are confident that this is this should work. But what well taken the points well taken, you can always come up with better control groups. Growth uh, and stability <laughs> is certainly another paper. So that's way way too broad for us to, to look at in this paper. Book to book to market value. Uh, we didn't we didn't uh, look at look at that. We we. Uh, we looked at, we have another paper, which is uh, cost of equity, which is a very new one now, where we look at cost of equity of SSM banks, and also find there that the cost of equity went down. For example, it was a good for, good for cost of equity, but it's very new work. It's, it's, it's in, the, we have a first version of this paper. No, no, cost of equity, cost of equity. We didn't look at return on equity, cost of equity. So this is, uh, this is, this, uh, risk weighted assets, uh, we controlled for that. What you said in the regression, so I didn't show it here, but in the regressions, when we compute the direct effects, we, we exactly control for different approaches that were taken to, to compute risk weights. So this is in the paper. I didn't tell it here for, for some reasons. This is done. But business model, sure. I mean, if you look at, if you look at uh, these indirect effects, and also quantitative, qualitative, if you, this, this is a point, but uh, as, 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 was, as I tried to explain, when you want to compute it, the total effect, you don't need to explicitly control for that. If you do the direct effect, you need to do it. Exactly. So this is the point, what type of effect you want to compute with your approach. So it depends what you, what you are after. And the last was, uh, I think I haven't got the rest. Yeah, the confidence. Uh, the confidence. The yeah. and the link with credit. The confidence and the link with credit, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. At least uh, we... Uh, we uh, we found that that uh, that uh, the SSM banks have, a, have a more deposits. I think it's good good for for the for deposits on the one hand, and on the other hand, they, they lend to to less risky in that sense to less risky uh, people. So that's that's basically the same result from the other paper. This is this is how how we interpret it. So, but I have to think again. I have to think more about about this point, to make it more clear. Sure. Any thanks? More questions? Okay. Uh, Twelve twenty-nine. So we have just some time for a break for lunch. Let me just say that um, it has been a very interesting morning. We have heard presentations that provide interesting empirical evidence, and that the SSM has not. not only made banks less risky, better provisioned, more able to give credit to the real economy, but even more profitable. But with this overwhelmingly positive note, I think we can break for lunch. So thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just.